staunch defenders of the Radeon RX 6500 XT would argue that it's good enough. It's a $200 graphics card made from the bits AMD had lying around in the workshop, and we really should be grateful they even bothered, considering how much more lucrative the laptop and high-end desktop markets have been in the last couple of years. Honestly, you can't get a better graphics card for the money in this market, can you? Well, can you? In this video, I'm going to argue... Hell yeah, you can. So, first, a bit of backstory. This is now the third video I've made on this graphics card, and I'm doing this for a couple of reasons. One is that I've wasted over £150 on mine and want to see some kind of return, but mainly it's because I can't quite believe just how badly AMD f***ed it up. I'd done my research, I knew what to expect. The raw performance chart on Tech Power Up suggested it was on par with the other $200 GPUs launched over the last half decade, continuing the disappointing trend of stagnation in that market segment. But of course, that's not the whole story. According to interviews, the GPU at the heart of the 6500 XT had been repurposed from stock intended for laptops, which would go some way to explain the narrow PCIe bandwidth, lack of encoder and display outputs. These factors would justify criticising AMD all on their own. The company reported record profits throughout 2021, so continuing to nickel and dime one of their biggest audiences is not a good look for them. Some people don't care about any of this, however. They just want to know if a product is good and if they should buy it. So I won't string this out too long if you want the bottom line on the card itself. It's pretty bad and not always for obvious reasons. It performs on par with similar cards for sure, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. You'll get playable frame rates in most games, sometimes well above average, sometimes well below. We'll get into specifics in a bit. 4GB isn't a lot for a modern car, but it's also not the end of the world. The issue of display outputs and video encoding depend on your own personal requirements, and from my own polling a lot of people probably won't miss them. No, I have two main issues which I struggle to forgive. First is the PCIe bandwidth. If you have a system that's older than 11th gen Intel or 3000 series Ryzen, you're not getting the most out of this graphics card and you can't do much but come to peace with that fact. If you're building from scratch, you could put together a $700 or £600 PC with full Gen 4 compatibility and exploit the full potential of this GPU, or you could cut corners on the CPU and motherboard and put the extra money towards the next tier of GPU and get more FPS in the process. There's arguments to be made for future-proofing on new platforms, as if new CPUs, memory and PCI Express standards aren't already on the horizon, but if I had this kind of budget for a gaming PC, I know which path I'd take. Secondly, and perhaps less obviously, is memory bandwidth. While testing on the Gen 4 system, I noticed that Control was having issues with certain textures and assets. I'd seen something similar with Halo Infinite on the Gen 3 system, but had put it down to the PCI Express bottleneck. After asking around, it turns out that the 6500 XT also uses a narrow 64-bit memory bus. For this reason, it seems large textures frequently fail to load. Although 4GB cards should have no issue with medium or even high textures in this game, the 6500 XT was acting like it had far less available VRAM. The problem recurred in Horizon Zero Dawn, popping up occasionally during cutscenes and on distant landscapes. To conclude my thesis then, the Radeon RX 6500 XT is bad, because it's a budget card that needs a less than budget PC to get the maximum performance, and it will make some of your games uglier than they should look. Thanks for coming, kindly leave a tip if you had a good time. Okay, okay. You still haven't got a graphics card, and I didn't really answer the question of what you should do with the $200 you've been patiently holding onto for the last year and a half. I could suggest you look at competing GPUs selling brand new in 2022, which, well, means the GTX 1650, but for one, I don't have a GTX 1650 right now, and my 2021 data from that card doesn't overlap much with my 2022 data. Secondly, the 1650 has already been compared with the new Radeons on other channels, and appears on the whole to perform closer to the RX 6400, with the 1650 Super being a fairer comparison, but is also curiously absent on retail shelves. And thirdly, comparing the latest AMD to the latest Nvidia doesn't really make my point about stagnation. 
I think the best way of examining that will be to compare the 6500 XT not just to the GPUs that filled its niche before it, but also to cards that are similarly priced on the used market here and now. It just so happens that I've been doing some prep work for this already. Since the RX 6500 XT released, I've been reviewing what I consider viable alternatives on the used market. From the lower end of the price spectrum, I've included the R9 290 and GTX 970. These much older cards were higher tier products in their day, but can be bought for significantly lower prices than the 6500 XT today. I've also looked at the RX 480, the original $200 bargain Radeon. I tried to get a GTX 1060, which was Nvidia's closest alternative at the time, but the one I bought got lost in the mail, and I haven't been able to replace it in time for this video. Finally, I'll be comparing some older, higher tier cards that can now be purchased for the same ballpark price as the 6500 XT. The R9 Fury X from AMD, and the GTX 980 Ti and GTX 1070 from Nvidia. The test platform for most of these was the 2022 moderately priced gaming PC, which despite using a Zen 3 based Ryzen 5 5600G, is unfortunately limited to PCIe 3. For some titles, I've also included figures from my testing of the 6500 XT on a PCIe 4 system based around an i5-11400. God of War proved to be an ideal title for the RX 6500 XT. At 1080 original, it could potentially be locked to 60fps, only dipping during cutscenes and certain intensive moments. The low cost alternatives are still acceptable, but don't quite hit the mark. Both the R9 290 and GTX 970 hover around the same 50fps average, and although the RX 480 does manage to maintain a 60fps average, its 1% low score is well into the 40s. The R9 Fury X comes in a frame or two short of the RX 6500 XT on average, and performs substantially worse in frame consistency. The higher end GeForce cards win by a hefty margin, and are on the borderline of being suitable for higher quality settings. Pretty much everything wipes the floor with a 6500 XT in Final Fantasy VII Remake. It's a tough game to pin down as it has dynamic resolution scaling and a habit of selectively sticking to 60fps even when the 120fps cap has been selected. Nevertheless, even the GTX 970 can outpace the new card here, though both display the same issue in the cutscene that occurs right before the start of my benchmark. In the GTX 970's case, I'd assume the dramatic slowdown is in some way related to its notoriously limited VRAM, but the 6500 XT doesn't have that excuse. I'm inclined to believe that either the PCIe or memory bandwidth bottleneck is claiming its first victim here. I've skipped Guardians of the Galaxy as the 6500 XT is proving to be inconsistent in the built-in benchmark, and it wouldn't be fair to compare it. Moving along then to Forza Horizon 5, at 1080 high the new car proves to be up to the task of maintaining a relatively constant 60 plus experience through the built-in benchmark. Previous gen Radeons, however, don't fare anywhere near as well, and nor does the GTX 970. The Fury X can't manage a 60fps average, even drop down to medium and using modded drivers. The RX 480 holds up best of the Radeons tested, only a frame or so behind the 6500 XT, and unlike its older stablemates, can actually render license plates correctly. The higher end GTX 980 Ti and 1070, however, are not troubled. The 980 Ti can keep a reasonably solid 60fps, but the 1070 blitzes the competition, almost hitting 90fps at high, and still managing a 60fps average at 1080 Ultra. If the 6500 XT has a killer app, it's Halo Infinite. I benchmark primarily in open world single player and big team battle multiplayer, in order to stress the GPUs as much as possible, and so far I've been forced to test everything at low settings. The 6500 XT is one of the few cards so far that can actually manage over 60 FPS with no resolution scaling. The Radeons seem to have a driver issue, as most of them play in the 30s, where their GeForce counterparts perform noticeably better. The GTX 980 Ti and 1070 come closest to the 6500 XT, but don't quite match it. That is, at low settings. At medium, the 6500 XT's bandwidth bottleneck introduces itself once more, causing the game to push low quality assets in place of trees, rocks and buildings, sometimes failing to draw scenery altogether. 
Now, none of the cards really have enough performance or game optimization to give a playable experience at medium in this game, but they can at least draw the damn scenery. The Radeon RX 6500 XT is among the worst at playing Cyberpunk 2077 using 1080 medium settings. The GTX 970 is the official minimum recommended graphics card by CD Projekt Red and it scored 36.7 FPS. This is roughly on par with the 6500 XT's 36.3 FPS. Beyond that, the scores climb pretty much as you'd expect, with the older Radeon scoring between 38 and 46 FPS and the higher-end GeForces scoring close to 60. It does appear that there may be a preference for Nvidia cards in this title, but still, this is pretty embarrassing. Things don't improve much for the new Radeon in Rainbow Six Sex Traction. At 1080 high, the GTX 970 falls first at just 70 FPS, then the 6500 XT at 74, followed by the Neck and Neck R9 290 and RX 480, then the Fury X, the 980 Ti and 1070. Not much to say here, I'm afraid. Thankfully, Splitgate is a title where the RX 6500 XT can really shine. Although the fastest cards are about as you'd expect, the 980 Ti wins, the 1070 and Fury X take second and third, the new card does at least beat everything else in the test by a noticeable margin. Well, noticeable if you've got a high refresh monitor, that is. I don't have the full data set for Call of Duty Vanguard. The GTX 970 was tested at 1080 medium with FSR quality, whereas everything else was tested at 1080 medium without any scaling, so I've excluded it from this count. The result from the RX 6500 XT depends on the PC you're using it on. The PCIe 3 results saw it manage only 85 FPS on average, putting it on par with the RX 480 and behind everything else except the R9 290. On the other hand, running on a PCIe 4 system actually puts it at the front of the pack, with an excellent 100 FPS average beating out even the higher NG forces. If anyone was asking how much difference that bottleneck could make, here's an answer. While I appreciate most people are more likely to play Fortnite with competitive quality settings, at that point the CPU plays more of a part in the FPS than it usually does, so I focused on the results from the high settings with epic view distance. The 970 comes in last at 66 FPS, beaten by the R9 290 and RX 480. The Fury X and 6500 XT are almost tied, while the GTX 980 Ti and 1070 are also tied for first place. Again, Battlefield 2042 doesn't have a complete data set. The GTX 970 was tested at 1080 low, whereas the rest were all tested at medium. Regardless, for the cards that did count, the results are mostly acceptable. The R9 290 could really benefit from being dropped to low as well, but that aside, everything hovers around a 60 FPS average. In that regard then, the 6500 XT actually stands out at a 70 FPS average, beaten only by the GTX 1070. For the final game in the comparison, once more there's incomplete information. This time both the GTX 970 and R9 290 were excluded. Of the remaining cards, the GTX 1070, 980 Ti and Fury X were all virtually tied around 85 FPS. The RX 480 was surprisingly close at 77 FPS, whereas the RX 6500 XT only managed 70 FPS. Far from being unplayable of course, but all things considered it really should have been closer to the top of the leaderboard. In terms of raw numbers, the picture isn't very flattering for the RX 6500 XT. Compared to its ancestor, the RX 480, the new card only wins in 7 of the 13 tests, and several of those victories were slim. I haven't tested the RX 580 this year, and I've yet to test a 590 or 5500 XT at all, but anyone in possession of one of those might find their old card actually pulls ahead in those marginal titles. The breakout success for the RX 6500 XT is Halo Infinite, 
The new card performs disproportionately well here, to a degree that makes me believe the game's devs didn't do any testing or optimization on anything but the latest architectures. The cynic in me would point out that the Xbox Series S and X have the same architecture as the 6500 XT, but in order to confirm that I'd need to test a bunch of cards I frankly can't afford. Strict performance aside, the RX 6500 XT doesn't look all that bad, especially if you have a Gen 4 system, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's good value. This is an immensely subjective thing. In terms of value for money, you might value the convenience of buying a new card from a retailer or having a manufacturer warranty over strict performance or price, in which case there really is only one option. If you're open to buying used, and if you're a regular to my channel, I'm guessing you probably are, there are still some variables I can't control for. Price is one. In this value chart, I've worked out the average cost per frame based on prices taken from current listings on ebay.com, but prices are in flux, especially in the wake of a few very bad weeks for cryptocurrencies. Then I've added the cost of a year's worth of electricity for running the card at full power for 20 hours a week based on the average US price of 10.42 cents per kilowatt hour. I'm not based in the US myself, my electricity costs are about four times higher and some countries pay even more than that, so the value analysis will be different depending on where you live. Finally, the efficiency calculation I've made is based on each GPU's official TDP. This isn't an ideal metric for power usage, and not all cards stick to the official spec. For example, my Strix GTX 1070 boosts over 10% above its official power limit, whereas my 6500 XT Dual rarely, if ever, approaches its rated 107 watt maximum. It might not be a perfect comparison then, but it does help make some conclusions. The cheapest cards, despite being relatively thirsty, perform remarkably well in terms of value. The R9 290 costs a lot to run sucking up as much power as far more potent cards, but comes close to the GTX 970 in performance, winning in many titles and losing in others. The 970 lost most of the benchmarks, the average FPS looks higher because I had to disqualify the tests where I ran it at lower quality settings in order to get a playable frame rate. On the other hand, it was very efficient for its time and can be had pretty cheaply now. The Fury X is competitive enough with newer cards that owners don't need to throw theirs out just yet, but the used market definitely values these cards way too highly, and they should probably not be considered by anyone shopping in 2022. For me, the stars of the show are the RX 480 and GTX 1070. The 480 is one of my perennial superstars of the used GPU market, due to its popularity, price and performance in modern titles. If past is any kind of precedent, there's also a strong chance the RX 480 and its relatives, the RX 580 and 590, will tumble in price sooner rather than later. The GTX 1070 is a surprise to me, mainly because I didn't realise how efficient it was, and prices on the used market are remarkably good for buyers in 2022. Both of these cards show other fringe advantages that raw performance numbers don't. Being relatively recent architectures, they don't suffer some of the flaws of the older models, GCN cards like the Fury and 290 don't receive official driver updates anymore, though that can be remedied by using Nemo's drivers instead. Maxwell cards like the 970 and 980 Ti run mostly flawlessly with modern titles, but there's an as yet unresolved issue with Guardians of the Galaxy that can once more only be worked around by messing with drivers. If you want RX 6500 XT-like performance in the majority of modern titles and none of the hassle of older cards, you should probably pick up an RX 480 or one of its newer variants. If you have $200 and want to get more performance than a 6500 XT can offer, the GTX 1070 is hard to beat. So where does all that leave the ostensible subject of this video, the RX 6500 XT? Well, in my opinion, in its current state, it's a waste of money. It should cost $150 or less, and in time I dare say this will be the case. I wouldn't be surprised if there were a 6550 refresh in the near future that fixes some of the current model's limitations. To current owners of RX 6500 XTs, I'd say now might be a good time to upgrade, especially as the market begins to flood with used cards and prices start to come down. If you can get $150 to $180 for your card, you could get yourself an upgrade for free. 
If you're in the market to buy a 6500 XT and aren't interested in the used market, I'd say congratulations for sitting through this video. And also maybe hang on to whatever it is you have right now for a little while longer. I know it's tempting to jump in now that graphics cards are available, but just hold on. If you have to save up or justify the added expense to yourself or whoever's paying for it, an RX 6600 or RTX 3050 is going to give a better experience for longer. If you're fixed in your $200 budget, even if there isn't an RX 6550 round the corner, there might be something coming from Nvidia, even if it is just a stop drop of 1650 supers. Hope that was useful to you. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.